Church, are you excited for the word this morning? Uh, if you will, let's just jump straight into it. Stuart, if you can help us with the doors and everything else. But I'm going to jump straight into the message this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, I'm going to read a passage of scripture uh, to you. Uh, basically, Paul uh, started, and you can go back and read this. I'm just going to give you a bit of context to what I'm going to teach on in the second service. We had a great first service. Uh, the focus may be a little bit different in this service, but I want to give you a little bit of context. Uh, without turning there, in Acts chapter 18, Paul starts uh, what we know to be the church in Corinth. Uh, but there was no church in Corinth until Paul stepped out to start it. How many know um, in order for you to start something, you got to step out? Right. It's going to take the spirit of faith for you to step out. Amen? Well, Paul stepped out. I mean, he, was, he, he went to, he went to uh, this region. We can see in Acts chapter 18. And basically, um, he does what he's always done. Find the nearest synagogue. Uh, in this new location that he found himself in. And uh, he went to worship the king. He went to worship the Lord, and there was a whole bunch of leaders, and, and he begins teaching, because the teaching gift was on his, on his life. And how many know your gift will make room for you? You realize that? Your gift will make room with you. If you steward it well, if you're faithful with it, I tell you what, your gift will make room for you. You don't have to make room for your gift. Your gift, given from Jesus the head, will make room for you. It will, it make, it will work for you. Amen? Uh, God will always let there to be an expression of that which he put on the inside of you. God's good and gracious that way. Amen? Amen. Well, certainly Paul is there teaching. He's reasoning from the scriptures. But the rel religious leaders didn't like what he was saying. And so they literally thrust him out of the synagogue. Can you imagine? He gets thrust out of the synagogue. He, uh, he then connects with some people in a house that is right next to the synagogue. <laughs> and uh, they find a common uh, way of life. They're in the same field of business. Paul made tents. They made tents, and so they kind of hooked up and partnered together. And, uh, and they just started sharing the word and preaching Christ, and people get born again. And the Bible says that many heard, many believed, and many, get, many got water baptized. And so Paul's not a pastor. He's not called to stay there in, uh, in that region in Corinth. So, um, so he's there for a year and a half, and then he leaves Corinth. But then it, it is reported to him that all kinds of stuff is happening in this church in Corinth that was birthed after having been thrust out of the synagogue for preaching truth. There's persecution going on. And he hears that many have received, many have received Jesus. Many um, are not ashamed of the fact that Jesus is now their Lord. Uh, many are making a public declaration and willing to get water baptized in front of their family and friends and a whole bunch of other people who, who just happen to be around to witness it. But the gospel isn't changing them. How many of the gospel is meant to change you, not just save you? Yeah. It's got to have an effect in your life. Amen. Um, and Paul is grieved by this, so he writes a letter to him, and I'm going to give a bit of context and then move on to some things that the Lord's told me to share to you. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he writes this letter to the church in Corinth. He's writing to the Corinthians, and he's addressing their behavior. He says, I have serious concern to bring up with you, my friends, using the authority of Jesus, our master. I'll put it as urgently as I can. You must get along with each other. Is he making it plain? Yeah. You must learn to be considerate with one another, cu cultivating a life, of, uh, a life in common. Now, Paul is saying, look, I know you're saved. I know you're born again. But boy, do you need to cultivate um, mutual honor. You need to get along with one another. You need to learn to be considerate. I don't know. This is a good letter. <laughs> I don't know, we need to read these kind of things from time to time. In verse 11, he goes on and says, I'm bringing this up to you. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because of Chloe in the church. Chloe, where, where's Chloe in the church? And apparently there was Chloe, and Chloe had a family, and, and he says, listen, this is from, from uh, 
uh, you know, uh, the King James, you can see it. Uh, according to the house of Chloe, you know, there's, there's contentions amongst you. And this is why I'm bringing it up. You know, it, it's brought, the message says, it's brought a most disturbing report to my attention. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because of what Chloe said to me. <laughs> uh, I love like church dynamics, don't you? <laughs> um, it's like T.D. Jakes. He said, you know, uh, you haven't seen a fight until you've seen a church fight. <laughs> It's, it's a sad reality, but praise the Lord. We're called to be a, a household of faith, a household of love, a household of the Spirit of God. Amen. And we are. This church certainly is. Amen. Amen. Love supplies. Love conquers. Love wins. Amen. Amen. Well, Paul goes on reading, uh, reading from the, the message. He says, you know, this disturbing report has been brought to my attention that you're fighting among yourselves. I'll tell you exactly what I, to- what I was told. You're all picking sides. You're going around saying, I'm on Paul's side, or I'm, or I'm for Apollos, or Peter is my man, or I'm in the Messiah's group. Keep this on the message, please, so they can see on the screen. Isn't this interesting? What is this? Divisions. Then verse 13, he goes on and says, I ask you, has the Messiah been chopped up in little pieces so that each, of, so each have a relic all our own? Was Paul crucified for you? Was a single one of you uh, baptized in Paul's name? I was not involved with any of your baptisms except for Crispus and Gaius. And on getting this report, I'm sure glad I wasn't involved in your baptism. <laughs> At least no one can go around saying that he baptized in my name. Come to the, I mean, come to think of it. I mean, I, I also baptized Stephanus's family, but as far as I can recall, that's it. What's Paul saying? He said, look, um, I preached the gospel to you, and I'm glad that uh, you received it, you heard it, you believed it, and you received it, but I'm happy that I didn't baptize you because the way in which you're living is no different to how you were living before you received Jesus. And so, so if I was there dunking you, yet you're saying publicly that I'm, I'm saved, I'm a believer, but no one around you can tell. He said, I, 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 that, con- that concerns me. The, 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 the state of... Your walk concerns me. Now, Paul goes on in the third chapter. Just move on to the first, third chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Um, praise the Lord. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this because there's divisions in the church. I'm not saying this because Chloe gave me a bad report. I'm not, <laughs> is there a Chloe in the church? <laughs> you, 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 but but there's a place I'm getting here. All right? But it's good. It's good for us. Reading from the King James, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, and I, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. And where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Paul goes on in the fifth chapter. Paul goes on in the fifth chapter, reading from the message this time. Fifth chapter, verse 1 and 2. He says, I also received a report of scandalous sex within your church family. A kind that wouldn't even be tolerated even outside the church. One of our men is sleeping with his stepmother. And you're so over it all. You're so over the divisions and the strives and the, and the contentions and the not getting along and, and all the sexual scandals and all this, this nonsense. You, you're so above, above it all. Um, he goes on and says this, that it doesn't even phase you. It doesn't even affect you shouldn't this break your heart shouldn't it bring you to your knees and tears 
Shouldn't this person um, and his conduct be confronted and dealt with? See, they, um, they had received Jesus, but they weren't acting like they even knew who Jesus was. And it's affecting Paul. It's, a, it's grieving him because he loves the church. And anything that we're trying to divide or shame or give, the bad, a, bit, give a bad rep to, to the church, it's grieving him. I remember when a couple in the church here, they, they went for lunch um, somewhere in town, the northern quarter of uh, Manchester. And um, just after church, they, that, that particular Sunday, they, you know, they didn't always wear a suit and a tie, but they just so happened to wear a suit and a tie. And they went to get some lunch and, with their family. And, and they walked into this restaurant and, um, and they, were, they were met by uh, two individuals, two, two, two guys. And, and uh, they kind of looked at them and, and was like, oh, have you guys just come from a wedding? And they said, oh, no, 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 you know, no, actually, we just come from church. You know, we just come from church, just you know, down the street, Faith Life Center. And they, they instantly was, their, their instant response was, you hate us. And they, these were a gay couple, homosexual couple. You hate us. And, and I thought when I heard this, when they were relaying this to me, I thought, that is the last thing the church ought to be, like, known for. I mean, hate? We, we should never be known. Oh, you guys, Christians, hate people who are in sin. No, no, we love people. Come on, I said we love people. And I don't know if it does something to you, but it makes me kind of, my heart break. To know that maybe the church has a, a reputation that, you know, you know we, we know best. And so therefore, hey, uh, we're looking down at everyone else who doesn't know what we know. You know, we're, we're looking down at people who are, who are not set free, but we're set free. So that's all what matters. I think it's pretty, it, it grieves me. You hear me? No, we should be known for love. It ought to be, come on, let's turn the table. Um, oh, you guys love us. You hear me? We love the people, the sin. Come on, Jesus dealt with it. So let's, let's help them receive Jesus, and then the sin's going to be dealt with. Come on, somebody. And they'll turn into a new person, new man, new woman. Amen. And, start, and they'll, they'll glorify God through their life. Hallelujah. So Paul is seeing this reputation that the church in Corinth is is getting, they're, they're getting a reputation of being people who confess the right stuff, do stuff in public, you know, say the right stuff, but their life contradicts their confession. And it's grieving his heart. And, and, and he said, man, this really should, should really break your heart. Your heart is hard. It's not broken. It's not open. It's not pliable. You hear me? And this uh, is not the intention, uh, the direction that I'm kind of focusing on right now. It's not the intention I'm wanting to get, get to. Um, but from it, the Lord began speaking to me about how do we tender, tenderize, if I can use that phrase, our hearts. Where we become soft and pliable for constant uh, change where we need to change ourselves. And where we can love unconditionally around the clock. Not just at good moments, good pockets, and good moments of our day, you know. Um, but no, uh, what is going to help us remain um, sold out for the cause of Christ? What's going to help us stay sensitive to His cause so we can line our our life to his cause, because when we favor his cause, he blesses those who favor his cause. Amen. Those who favor his cause are favored. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. They're the type who say continually, let the Lord be magnified, who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God prospers those who line their lives up with his cause. Why? Because if I can get provision and prosperity and resources into the lives that are aligned, aligned to the cause of Christ, they will support the cause of Christ. 
and so the cause of Christ will advance. Amen. He gets seed to the sower. Hallelujah. And so what's so super important, because we're talking about, I kind of didn't give my message title, but we're talking about secret keys to increase. This is a month of increase, people, right? Anyone excited about increase? Yeah. Yeah. Increase. Increase on the mind. All right. Number one, align your life to the cause of Christ. What's his will, his way, his word? I'm going to align my life to that. When I favor his cause, he favors my life. I walk in the favor of God, I'm telling you. Something special, I know it. I know it, and you can know it too for your, you and your, your household. But I know it like I know my name. I know it. Favor is on my life. I know it. And that's not me being prideful or braggadocious, but I just know favor is on me. I cannot escape from favor. Uh, I'm not wanting to escape from favor, but I'm favored. My wife is favored. My girls are favored. My whole household is favored. My parents are favored. All my siblings are favored. I mean, as a family, we cannot escape it. Not trying to escape it, but I'm telling you, we're favored of the Lord. Favored. I, mean, I know it. There's no question about it. I don't, we don't think think twice about it. We don't have to second guess. We don't have to pray for it. How many of even God's plans? You don't have to pray, pray that God would bless his plans. You've got to align your life to his plans. His plans come pre-packaged blessed. It's free package blessed. So when you just line your life to his, his plan, I tell you, you walk in the blessing of the Lord. Oh, glory to God. And this is time. It is time for us to walk in the increase that God wills for us to walk in. But we've got to walk in it one way is you align your life to his cause. Amen. Amen. Another area is you stay pliable. You stay sensitive. You st- stay open. Your heart is, is tender to the things of the Spirit. It's a heart deal. God wants to deal with the heart. Because this church in Corinth, it wasn't that, you know, the reason why their life wasn't uh, changed wasn't because they didn't experience the power of God. It wasn't just because they heard words, you know, that were empty and they never ex- experienced, tasted and, uh, t- tasted and saw that, that the Lord was good. No, that they saw it. They, 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 they witnessed the power of God. This is a tongue-talking bunch. This is a church that had uh, the gifts of the Spirit flowing. There was, there was great demonstrations of the Spirit. There was great healings in this church. And Paul, in fact, he tells them in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, he said, My speech and my preaching were not, uh, uh, I didn't come preaching to persuade you. Because uh, I know that, that, that uh, no matter how eloquent a message may be or how persuasive a message may be, it won't, your faith that is based on a message cannot keep you standing firm in faith. The one who can is the God in the message, not the message. You understand what I mean? And thank God there's God in the message, in the Word, when you preach the Word. But, but not when we're, you know, just you know, just impressed by eloquence. That's, right. That's not going to sustain you. That's right. um, in fact, um, you guys, I came to you with power and demonstration of the Spirit. So you tasted and you saw and there was power and there was healing and there was the lame say, uh, raised up and the deaf heard and the blind saw. Oh man, you, church in Corinth and he's putting pen to paper now. He said, man, you guys... If there is any church I've ever preached in, if there's ever, church, if there's, if there's ever been a church that I, that I started that had the power of God actively operating in it, it was your church. You guys experienced the power and demonstrations. And yet, there's people sleeping with their mother-in-laws. Come on, somebody. There's divisions and there's like no genuine change. So the power itself can be impressive and awesome, even stuff that God was genuinely doing in that place. But I'm telling you, uh, if your heart's not impressed with the 
miracle maker That's than right. the miracle itself. The great miracles cannot sustain your faith. Amen. The miracle maker, the healer, is going to be the one who's impressing awesome. you. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Woo! Come on now. Well, this goes right down to where's our, where's our love, where's our focus, where's our praise, where, where, where's our devotion, you know? Uh, and I'm hearing what Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He said, man, you guys saw it. And see, uh, other people in the Bible, if you just study the word, you can see that Pharaoh, he experienced the power of God. But, uh, you know, it's as if he just he, he, he rebelled and rebelled and rebelled and rebelled, you know, nine times, you know. Um, against what the messenger Moses was saying that he should do. Let my people go, you know, says, 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 says the God of hosts. But he just would not do it. Yet power was right in front of him. You see Samson, Samson, literally, Samson, every day he is, he is waking up to the power of God surging through his body. Come on, he's like a powerhouse, and he's waking up, um, and God is faithful to, to pour the power of God in his body, and he's experiencing that firsthand, and yet 20 years of that, he still finds his, his head in the lap of a pro- prostitute. Come on, somebody. Yet he experienced the power of God. Judas, Peter, experienced the power of God. I mean, it, 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 I mean how many? How many miracles did they witness firsthand? There aren't enough bugs in the world to contain all that took place through the life of a ministry of Jesus. Amen. It's still being written because he's living his life through us in this, in this dispensation of grace. Amen. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The distilled translation says, I consider myself as having died, and now I'm simply enjoying my second existence, which is Jesus using my body. The ministry of Jesus is still ongoing on the planet right here, right now, through you, through me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the amount of miracles that Peter witnessed and Paul witnessed, and uh, sorry, Peter and Judas and all the other guys witnessed, yet Judas betrays Jesus, having been in the presence of all this outworking of miracles. Peter, in the presence of, of the miracle maker and witnessing it all firsthand, yet he denies Jesus. You think, what is going to cause these people to change? Children of Israel, bread literally coming down from heaven. Is that supernatural? I mean, there's God baking bread up, up, up in heaven and throwing it down. Fresh bread. I mean, every day. Isn't that something? Water coming out of rocks. Pillar of fire by night. Pillar of uh, cloud by day. Oh, my, I, and, and, and witnessing the power of God. Yet Moses goes up to the mountain on a heavenly assignment um, and, uh, and then comes back three days later. And guess what? They've got a new God. They, they, idolatry is there. They, they've erected a new God. And, and Moses is thinking, what in the what? Like, Have you been witnessing? Like, guys, have you forgotten about this, the Red Sea and how God got us out? And he was faithful to to pr- prophecies and it's the heart that must change it's the heart that must stay tender and this is the key whether or not we realize that this is the key to increase is our heart condition here oh man I, I, I'm telling you so Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 says blessed are the pure in heart for they will see they will see God there is something about a pure heart, and there's something about a heart that just, uh, with, with no other motive, goes before God in worship and praises Him. There is something, and this is what I want to get to, the power of, the power of um, worship. The power of worship. Because... Um, <clears throat> There's, there's few things that can purify your heart motives better than worship. Amen. It purifies you. Yes. Worship does. Yeah. 
Remember, I think I alluded to it last uh, Sunday where, where David would come to worship in front of Saul when Saul was tempted. Remember that? He was tormented by stuff. So do you know what David did? He tormented the tormenting stuff. How? With his worship. Come on, worship is a weapon. Worship will just annihilate the plans of the devil. Worship will shut up the mouth of the liar. Will shut the mouth of a lion. Come on now. Worship. David was a worshiper. And there was cleansing that was experienced. There was a, there was a pure, purifi- purification that was going on when, when David would worship in um, Saul's presence. And Saul just so enjoyed um, the worship of David, but he never became a worshiper. It's one thing to enjoy worship it's another thing to be a worshiper you understand what i mean it's one thing to know how to put on a cd press play and just enjoy it it's a whole nother thing entirely to go okay i'm hooking up to the spirit to, and i'm I, i'm coming father you're looking for those who would worship me and worship you in spirit and in truth so here i am i'm giving my heart into this i'm giving my soul into this Oh, my spirit is connecting to yours. And I came for no other agenda but to worship you. To worship you. Like young King Uzziah. He said, said, as long as young King Uzziah sought the Lord, the Lord made him prosper. Just for the Lord. Not for stuff. Not for wisdom. Not for strength. Just for the Lord. As long as he sought the Lord. Just for the Lord. Come on. Not for money. Not for cars. Not for houses. Not for uh, anything else, but just for Him. Is it wrong to believe God for for all those things or or to uh, ask Him in faith for wisdom? Absolutely not. That's scriptural. But if all of our worship and all of our prayers are to get, and if, 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 if the majority of our time isn't spent just, Lord, I'm here to worship You. I'm here to love on You. I'm here to worship You then I think we are actually seeking the wrong things. Oh, my, 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 my. I tell you, worship, worship. Someone say worship. 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 You know, it was uh, Peter who said, uh, let's just go there. First Peter. Oh, my, my, my. Anyone believe that God's doing things in your life? Come on, people. Come on, which household in this room believes that God is up to things? He's doing things in your family. He's doing things in your body. He's doing things. Amen. The Lord's working on your case because you've yielded it over to Him. Hallelujah. It says in 1 Peter chapter uh, chapter 1, it says in verses, um, well, let's see this, verses... Uh, 7, it says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise. Faith, faith's highest expression is praise. Uh, faith's highest confident note of victory is praise. And faith, how many know Jesus is looking for faith? Yeah. He's always been looking for faith. Yeah. He said uh, when he saw the faith that the Roman centurion operated in, in Matthew chapter 8, he turned to his disciples. He said, I have not found such great faith, which knows he was looking for it. I have not found. He was looking for faith. When the Son of Man returns, Luke chapter 18, verse 8, does it say that? When the Son of Man returns, will he find real faith? He's always been looking for faith. He is looking for faith. And he will be looking for faith when he returns. And what is he looking for? Genuine faith. What does genuine faith look like? Genuine faith, when found, when, when tested by fire. Come on now. Not in the message. King James, please. Um, when tested by fire. Praise the Lord. Look at this. It may be found, verse 7, to praise, to honor, 
to glory. Genuine faith. Come on, somebody. Genuine faith honors, praises, and glories in the finished work of Christ. Amen. It goes on to say, who, whom having not seen. Glory to God. Verse 8. You love, though not though now you do not see him, yet believing, yet you believe, having not even seen, yet you believe. Come on, somebody. Yet you believe. And how do you express this belief? You rejoice. That's how we know you, you are believing. You rejoice with what? With joy. So this isn't a sad rejoicing. This is a happy rejoicing. He said, you're going to rejoice with joy. Gladness with joy. But the oil, uh, there is an oil of joy. Woo, come on now. Oh, and it, it helps you experience and receive that which you have believed for and see the end of your faith. It goes, joy, uh, joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving, the next verse says, receiving the end of your faith and the salvation of your souls. So you don't have to see anything to get happy and to know that God is doing a mighty work. Just turn to Luke chapter 8, verse 15. We're talking about increase here. I hope you brought your, your notepad and pen here. Oh, I see it. <laughs> we'll say you're writing an article here. She's got two columns here. <laughs> it's not the newspaper here, is it? News, news. Luke chapter 8. They're coming in, though. Luke chapter 8, verse 15. It says, this is the parable of the sower. So or so in the word, Jesus said, but, w- w- but what on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, notice this, honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth with patience. Patience is what causes the vine to bear fruit. Love is patience. Patience is what causes the vine to bear fruit. How many of you got to be patient with what is in the un- unseen realm, what's hidden that you can't see, yet it's growing? You know, the, the, the Far East, the Chinese bamboo tree. Anyone, anyone know a little bit about the Chinese bamboo tree? Well, uh, when we're, well, it takes like, they say uh, five years before you see, see any growth. So, so what happens is, you know, you plant that thing, and it's in all in the unseen, seed form, seed form. It's in all, it's all in the unseen. And here's the deal. Um, someone has to come every day to war it, and every day to fertilize it, fertilize it. And, uh, and they're doing this every day. And, and yet they're doing it every day for not just one year, two years, three years, four years. How many know you go out in your front, front, front garden patch there, and, and there's just a, a, just, just, just a patch of soil right there. And every day you come with your watering kind of stuff. And you, you're there, and you're just, pour, you're, you're just doing your, your duty. What are you doing? You're watering it. You're fertilizing it. What are you doing? You're, you're, you're believing despite not seeing. Now, I think most people after 34 years, come on now, give up on this seed is a corrupt seed. I'm telling you, this seed, I'm, am I ever going to see this seed? I mean, it's been, what, five years and we haven't seen nothing. Your neighbors come by and say, what are you doing? I mean, there's some plants over there. War, they look like they need watering. You're just watering a patch of soil. <laughs> Come on, people, people, people you, you, you're talking about, oh, you know, praise God, there's so much things happening in my life. You know, I've got a dream. I'm watering my dream, you know. Uh, uh, I'm fertilizing my dream. I'm praising God. That's how you water is by praising, by the way. Just FYI, you'll see in the word. But I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thanking God for what's going on in my life. I mean, well, where is it? Well, look, it's right here. That's why I'm here with my warring canister. That's why I'm praising God right here. Uh, see, see, you've got you to keep on warring the dream. <laughs> and after five years, you've got, you've got, you've got tremendous growth in the space of five weeks 
the bamboo, the bamboo Chinese bamboo tree can grow 90 feet in five weeks. The question is, did it grow 90 feet in five weeks or did it grow 90 feet in five years and five weeks? <laughs> Come on, it was growing the first, first moment it was put in the soil, it's growing. So what's your confession? It's working. Your confession is, it's growing. What? I, well, yeah, I can't see it. So? It's in there. I know it's in there. And that's why I'm being diligent. But see, if, if just one day you decided not to water it or fertilize it, you wouldn't see it spring up to 90, 90 feet. If you just forgot the watering process of the seed sown. Praise, write this down. Praise is the key factor that will bring the seed to full harvest. Woo. Praise is the key factor that will bring your seed all the way through to full harvest. Turn to Psalms 67 verse 5 to 7. Psalm 67 verse 5 to 7. It says, let the peoples praise you. Oh God, let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth. <laughs> then, when, when, when the peoples. I love that because my, my girls, when we drive up to church, they're like, oh, the peoples are here. <laughs> you know, when they see all your cars and stuff, oh, the peoples are here. Because <laughs> sometimes we bring, them, we bring them in, you know, when no one's here, you know, and uh, to, to do work or whatever and no other cars, but ours are here. And so, so when we drive up in all you guys' cars here, oh, the peoples. Yes, the peoples. He said, let all the peoples, not just, not just this section, but all the peoples. The peoples in this section, the peoples in that section, the people watching online right now. He said, let them all praise. And then, come on now, it's not this verse. It's Psalm 67, verse 5 to 7. It says, let, all, let the peoples praise you, O Lord. Let all the peoples praise you. Psalm 67, verse 5 to 7. Then, it says, verse 6, then the earth shall yield her increase. When? Praise. Why? Because praise is the key factor that will bring, praise is the key factor that will bring your seed to full harvest. Do you think praise is important? Yes. I think the Lord's speaking to us about praise this year. Why, uh, this, this month. Why, why would he? Because praise is the watering can. Praise is the fertilizer. Praise is the weapon. Come on now. Amen. It's the trigger. It's the very thing that will release the increase that's in the seed and you will see the end of your faith. There is something between believing and receiving the end of your faith. There's something in the middle. Something between. Believing, something in between believing and receiving, it's rejoicing. And you take rejoicing out, you won't see the end of your faith. You hear me? Man, I thought you, you would actually start doing the word right at this moment. I thought, you know what? People are going to jump up and down and go, I'm gonna, I, choose, I choose to praise the Lord right now. <laughs> I, saw it, I saw it in my dreams, you know, like, and my dreams are coming to pass. I'm just warring it. I'm just warring it right now. How many know we're called to be doers? Come on, has anyone got seed in the ground? Has anyone got a dream that you're warring? Has anyone got something? Come on, that thing is about to shoot up. 90 feet. It's, 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 there's going to be a suddenly here and a suddenly there. But do you know who this is for? Do you know who this is for? It's those who don't quit. Don't quit on the warring canister. <laughs> <laughs> it's the rejoices. Yeah, so my wife, she's so good, man. She's so d d diligent to, to war our gardens, and we're, we're reaping the benefits of her hard labor. I mean, all last year, I mean, she's warring just soil. You know, I'm thinking, dear Lord, you know, what are you doing? You know, and uh, uh, but now I'm like, she's smarter than I was going to say something else, but she's smart. She looks smart, and she is smart. <laughs> And, and, but, but when she was gone, you know, I, I just loved that. I loved um, warring the flowers. 
when she was gone. Obviously, in this heat, we needed it, right? Yeah. But how many know your dreams need it? Yeah. Especially when the heat and the pressure and, the, uh, and, and all these other natural things um, around that field of faith yeah. starts to put pressure on the seed, starts to nag at you that there's nothing coming up. Quit now. Do you know what you do? You go right to where you put that canister. You go right to the spout. You let the glory be poured out on the inside of you. How is it going to be poured out? Come on now, because you, you, we water this with our praise. You've got to be filled. Like the canister's got to be filled, you know? You've got to be filled so that you've got it to give. You understand what I'm saying here? And see, it's, it's a double whammy here. You release it with praise, and you get filled up with praise. Yeah, man. <laughs> Ooh, I'll tell you, it's a double whammy. It's like, oh, okay, don't miss the point. Praise, praise, right? Just praise, praise, praise. That's probably why Paul said, you know, to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, you know, uh, praise the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Can we get filled whilst you're rejoicing? And then let it out. Come on. Re- release the praise. Release the fresh infilling through the vehicle of praising the Father. Are you hearing it? Are you working with this analogy right here? Fill the canister with praise and then release the contents of the canister with praise. What am I going to do? I'm watering the seed sown. Because I determine, because Lord, you said it, this is a time of increase, so I'm going to get real diligent here to get filled up, and my canister's going to get filled up, and I'm going to release this, and I'm not quitting on no seed that I put on the ground. And it, in fact, listen, it's not your seed. You're being a steward of it. He gives seed to the sower. It's not even your seed. It's something that he gave to you. How are you stewarding what he gave you? We steward the seed with praise. Oh, and that's how it grows. Come on up. We do something. We do something with it. We do something with it. Hallelujah. Praise ripens the fruits of the Spirit. Woo, come on now. Uh, praise uh, uh, lubricates and oils life's activities. So there's just a glide to you. There's a way in which you, you, you do life with ease. How? There's a release of the anointing of God through what? Praising the Lord. Ooh, man, I'm, I'm called to do this, you know. Man, we're, 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 this, I'm anointed for this. Father, I want to praise you for the things I've got to do today. Come on, you wake up. Man, I've got a task list that is triple the length of yesterday's, but I praise you and I thank you because there's an oil of gladness and an oil of joy and an anointing that is released that lubricates life's activity that causes me to just flow with him. Without toil. Woo, glory. The praise of the Lord. I'm going to preach as long as I need to before we start actually praising and doing the word. Amen. Because we're doers in this church. Amen. We wake up. How would your walls describe you? Your walls in your bedroom. If we could ask them, hey, tell, tell, me, t- tell me about the real Joel. Tell me about him. Is he a praiser? Is he a worshiper? If they can't say he is, then I'm not. What's the first thing I do when I wake up? What's the last thing I do when I go to bed? How would my walls describe me? Not how other people describe me when I'm here. How do my walls describe me? Because God sees me. And God so wants, like a father, I was on the way in, you know, because um, Evie came early for prayer, and I'm like trying to get, yeah, I'm, getting, I'm not trying, I'm a doer. I'm not a trier, I'm a doer. I'm a doer. So I, I, I do, did dress my kids, right? And, and uh, I dressed my children, and they look pretty good. I mean, they don't look too bad. I mean, she made it very easy for me. She laid it all out for me, you know, three piles. 
Uh, the shoes were a bit of an issue because the shoes weren't mixed to the socks, so I had to figure out what shoes goes with this. And so that was complicated, but uh, the oil of, of, of God, the anointing of God, just lubricated my activities, and those shoes slipped on, and they slipped on like no sweat. Praise the Lord. Anyway. Uh, but on the way in, I was thinking, man, ah, you know, I just didn't think about the bubble situation. But thank God for an older sister who's 10 now, double figures. So she brought the box and she brought a whole bunch of bubbles. But it just triggered a thought how much I want my girls to be abundantly provided for. I don't want a clip missed. I don't want a, a, a bubble missed. You know, uh, as a dad, I want to I wanna make sure they're provided for. How much more are daddy? Come on. That's right. He so wants you to increase in life. He so needs you to increase in life it, so that you can focus on the main thing and fulfill the purpose on your life. Hallelujah. Praise is the expression of utmost confidence. Utmost. Come on. Utmost confidence in God's word. Acts 16, 25, what do we see? We see an example of Paul the Apostle practicing what he preached. What was he doing? Midnight hour. Praising, singing, glorifying the king. See, praise is designed for the midnight hour and for every hour. In fact, every single prayer of Paul's. See, we're, 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 we're revealing secrets that would help us unlock and release the resurrection power of Almighty God that resides on the inside of us and that is ready to be poured out. How do we know resurrection power within it Come on now, Jesus became poor so that we could become abundantly provided for. So the word of God says, right? He became poor so that we could be rich. The word rich means um, to have all, all conceivable good, to be abundantly provided for. The word prosper, prosperity, is the word good journey. And it means, hey, we've all got a journey. We're, we are here now, but we need to get over there. And that's our final destination. And when we get there and cross the uh, finish line, we're going to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful sh sh uh, servant. But here's the deal. You can't fulfill the call of God in your life without prosperity. You need to prosper. And a good journey where you run out of money to fill it up with petrol, diesel, whatever you run on, is not a good journey. Without food, it's not a good journey. Without AC working, it's not a good journey, right? <laughs> Food, it's not a good journey. People to help you along the way, that's not a good journey. But to prosper is to have a good journey. When you get there on time, you get there without lack, you get there with everything in place, amen. You get there in good timing, you get there efficiently, that's prosperity. That's prosperity. And you have a really good time along the way. Nothing like a good road trip. Nothing like a good journey. You hear me? So God wants this for us. Now, every single prayer of Paul's, you know, we're, we're looking at this. Uh, you know, we want the secret. We want the secrets, the secrets to release this resurrection power, which within it deals with our prosperity. When we examine, we're looking for the secrets. Well, when we examine the lifestyle or the prayer life of the apostle Paul, a secret is revealed. And that is praise. Judging by scriptural, script, uh, the scriptural record, Paul never prayed without giving thanks. Never. There was never a prayer he prayed where he was not giving thanks. I'm going to give them to you real quick. First Thessalonians 1, 2. We give thanks to the, to, to the God always for all, making mention of you in our prayers. Colossians 1.3, we give thanks to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember, remember you in my prayers night and day. Philippians 1.3-4, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of my making requests, for you all with joy. Not only did he um, pray this way with praise, but he also taught others and cultivated it in the lives of his understudies or his disciples. We see in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. In everything. Not for everything, but in everything. Come on now, in everything, no matter what you're in. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus 
for you. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Spirit of God. I want to give you a few more, a few more points here. And this, this is going to help you, encourage you. Look at the power of this weapon called praise. Psalms 8 verse 2 says, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Praise stops the enemy of lack. I'm just going to give you the points and I can't preach them because that's it, time's up. It stops the enemy of lack. Praise does. Amen. Come on, think about it. Praise stops the enemy of lack. There is an enemy. He's trying to, try, try, trying to come in. Um, Psalms 9 verse 1 to 3 says, I praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your holy name. O Most High, when my enemies turn back, they will fall and perish at your praise. Praise pushes back lack. Love to preach it. Praise causes lack to fall and perish. Praise, according to Psalm 22, verse 3, praise brings the presence of the provider on the scene. Woo! Praise brings the presence of the provider on the scene. Where he inhabits the praises of his people. When we pray, 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 when we pray, we get into his presence. When we praise, he comes into ours. He inhabits the praises of his people. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So, So literally, praise invites the presence of the provider to deal with whatever it is that you are having to deal with. Different translations of this verse, New Century says this, You sit as the Holy One. The praises of Israel are your th- throne. Think about it. Your praises are His throne. Amen. The basic English says, You are holy, O oh, you who sit among the praises of Israel. Oh, man. The New English says this, you are holy, you sit as a king receiving the praises. You sit among the praises and you receive the praise. So when we begin to praise and thank him, he comes in and he literally sits down in the middle of our praise. Come on now. He's like, you're, you're surrounded by bells or surrounded with a situation, you know, bad church situation or a bad marriage situation or a bad whatever situation. And you just go, okay, 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 okay. In everything. In everything. We're going to give you praise. Father God, I want to praise you. Oh, praise pushes back lack. Praise stills the enemy. Praise shuts the mouth of Satan. Praise invites the provider. Praise. Oh, Father, through my praise, I create and I build a throne for you to sit on. And so I build a throne right over all this mess, over all these bills, over all this situation. I praise you. And I'm inviting you. I'm preparing the place for you to come in and sit right in the middle of it, which is a note of victory. Where sit, he sits sitting on it. It's done. I'm not stood up trying to figure it out. It's done. It's finished. Praise. We praise you. We praise you. Father, Father, we praise. We praise you for every seed that you've given this church. Yes, Lord. And we do not count it lightly. And when I, say, when I say seed to this church, I'm talking about vision and plans God's spoken to you about. He gave the seed to you. He gave the idea to you. He gave the strength to you. He gave the gifts to you. Lord, we will be stewards of this. We will be good stewards of this. And so right now, since it came from you. We get right now under the spout of your glory. And we praise you. And we magnify you. And we say, for the Lord is good. And his mercies endure forever. We say, the Lord is good and his mercy 
endures forever. We say it again, for the Lord is good. And, uh, and His mercy endures forever. See, when they did that, they says that the cloud, the cloud filled the house. Filled the house. When? When? When the, when, when the, come on, when the, when the 120 uh, trumpeters got to sound in their trumpets, when the 900 strong choir started to sing as one accord. Come on now. When, the, when, when those with the instruments started to play with one voice in one accord, and when every voice in the house, when all started saying, God is good, and His mercy endured forever, there was an outpouring of heaven. There was the glory cloud that filled the house. Don't you know you are the house, the habitation of God? How do I fill the house? The same way they filled that house. They said, He is good, and His mercy endures forever. He is good. Come on, this is worship. And His mercy endures forever. They praised, and they sang, and they praised, and they sang, and He filled the house. He filled the house. He filled the house. Woo! He filled the house. And what did it do to their praise? The same thing it will do to our praise. It will cause it to go up another level. It will intensify it. And it will give you the water needed to, to sprinkle on and drench. Come on now. And saturate. Give exactly the right amount that you need to release to the seed that He gave and planted on the inside of you. Every promise is a seed. He fills you with the water and He empowers you to do the water. How am I going to release it? The same way you received it. The sa- how am I going to release it? The same way you received it. Saying, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. And His mercy endures forever. Come on, the Lord is good. And His mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good. And His mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good. And His mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good. Hallelujah. And now your heart is filled, saturated. And there's production going on. Because you chose to praise Him. 